Welcome to The View from the Front. My name is Stan, and this is the July 20th edition. Today we are talking about three big stories involving Ukraine that you have to know about. There's definitely some intrigue going on that I get into just a bit. I think you're really going to enjoy that. And then we highlight three things going on with our U.S. military that you probably haven't heard about any of these three things, so you definitely want to stick around for that. And then, of course, we'll cover plenty of motivation and wisdom at the end. So I think it's going to be a great episode, guys. Thanks for joining us. If you are new to the show, let me say as background that I covered the news for more than 10 years as a journalist. And before that, I served six years in the Marine Corps, spending all six years in the infantry. Each week, I primarily do three things. I work to highlight what our military troops are doing around the world, while also covering hotspots and foreign policy news that could affect our country. I attempt to unite our beautiful land and remind us of how lucky we are to live in America. Our division is our country's greatest threat, and I want to remind us that most Americans are good. Finally, I always share plenty of motivation and wisdom at the end of each episode because I want to help encourage you and lift you up. Life is certainly hard, and each one of us needs all the motivation and encouragement and wisdom that we can possibly get. Thanks again for joining us. I really hope you get something from the show. As I said earlier, we're going to cover three big things about Ukraine, but before we get into that, let me just say I've got some big personal news. I did drop a new book this week, and when you're an author, that's something that doesn't happen too, too often, but this was the 12th book I've written. This one's called Ukrainian Fire. It is the fifth book in the Nick Woods series. He's a former, or I should say prior, USMC sniper who initially gets dragged into a government conspiracy and then eventually does some work for the government, and so there's been five books in that. It's my best-selling series, and it's the number one email I've continually gotten the past few years is when are you finishing the next Nick Woods book? Among the people who enjoy reading my books, Nick Woods is probably the most iconic character because he's not some Superman. He's just a tough dude from the South. And so a lot of people just say he's, hey, he's a very real character. So I'm really proud to have that book done. It did take a lot. I apologize for how long it took. I had it actually going my way, mostly done. And then real life events intervened and Russia invaded Ukraine last year, which totally wrecked the plot. Of course, that is nothing compared to the horrific things that the Ukrainian people have had to go through, but it did cost me, you know, a, about two years of effort, and so it took a lot of emotional and mental and physical energy to tear the book apart, come up with a way that I could still make it work. Having said all that, it ended up being probably the best book I've ever written, at least according to my editor, and so really good book. Check it out. I do recommend actually you start with the beginning of the series if you're really going to get into it. That book is literally called Sold Out because the main character, Nick Woods, gets sold out, but you can find it on Amazon. You can search my name, Stan R. Mitchell, and the word sold out, or look anywhere on social media and find it easily. So... Yeah, big week for uh, Stan. But let's get to the news because, like I said, these are three big stories that I think you will really want to hear about. This week, I want to discuss three major stories that I think you need to know about what is happening in Ukraine. Now, this first one, I'm going to bet you've probably heard a little bit about Ukraine used naval drones to attack the Kerch Bridge. That is that huge 12-mile-long bridge for both road and highway traffic as well as railroad traffic. It's very, very important for Russia as it continues to supply and operate from the Crimean Peninsula, which is, of course, illegally occupied ground that Russia took back in 2014. So there's two main ways to get to the Crimean Peninsula. The first one is the Kirk, uh, Kerch Bridge. The second one is through a land bridge of area that they have illegally occupied since last February. Now the Ukrainians are trying to drive across the land bridge to cut that off in the southern part of the illegally occupied territory, and they're also trying to destroy this massively long 12-mile-long bridge called the Kerch Bridge. So 
Like I said two days ago, that was attacked by naval drones. It was damaged pretty bad in one area. The Russians are trying to say, hey, it wasn't that bad. It'll be fixed that these spans happened to basically split almost perfectly where they needed to. So it should be pretty easy for them to repair. That's what the Russians are saying. I'm not really sure what the truth is on that. I do know that it appears that the spans underneath the bridge, which were probably the ideal target, did not get the kind of damage that I think the Ukrainians wanted, but it did damage part of the bridge for sure. And perhaps more importantly, it shows, you know, Russia's Navy is limited on how much it can operate in any open waters. Obviously, they've lost some ships and been targeted both by naval drones and anti-ship miss missiles. So if you're Russia, it's got to be a little concerning on how this attack happened because a 12-mile bridge is a very long bridge to have to try to defend. So I'm sure the Ukrainians will try again, and I'm sure they learned some lessons from this attack, and their next one might be a little bit better. Lots of Russians were trying to flee from the Crimean Peninsula because they do not want to be cut off and left in this area that eventually the Ukrainians hope to liberate. But again, the Ukrainians did attack the Kerch Bridge. That is the second major attack that's been done to it. There was an earlier attack last October. The second major thing I wanted to discuss is a bit of an update on the counteroffensive in Ukraine on the land portion of the attacks. It's kind of some uh, interesting things happening there and some interesting discussions being made. I'm going to go into all of that quickly. I think you're going to find it very interesting. As you know, it hasn't really made the news lately, and so usually that means there's more going on than you would think. As an overview, you know, Ukraine does continue to make limited advances and th but they have yet to do what are considered larger scale operations that american uh, leaders and generals believe when they're talking off the record that they believe these a larger attack could enable a breakthrough however the ukrainians are doing these really small mine clearing attacks often even using as few as four sappers what they call them that literally go out into these sprawling minefields and they're just digging with, often with just bayonets, looking for mines. It's the safest way to actually remove them. And so they're doing this, and it's reducing the number of casualties while they're also targeting deeper artillery units and weapons depots and other logistical areas of the Russians. But it seems like this week, for from what I can tell, that increasingly U.S. officials are beginning to get a little frustrated. So we're going to go into the weeds a bit on that because, again, this hasn't really made the news, but that's often when there's a little bit more happening behind the scenes than you know. So I want to talk about a Washington Post article that I, I read that really goes into how the Ukrainians are using these sappers to clear the minefields and some of the challenges that they're facing. So from the Ukrainian perspective, here's kind of what happens. First of all, the Russians are using drones to spot any type of movement of Ukrainian armor or Ukrainian vehicles. And particularly, the Russians are looking for specialized mine clearing equipment. And anytime they see it, they target it. And so the Ukrainians have lost some of their equipment that was used for mine clearing. And they're also very hesitant to use what they have left because they claim they have a very limited amount of this type of equipment. So that's the first thing. So they're, they're instead of doing what the U.S. wants, they're using these small groups of four men. Also making it more difficult is the Russians have drones that can reseed the mines. So there are times where they will clear some of the mines and the Russians will send a drone behind some of these units and replant mines in areas that they believe the Ukrainians might go through. Uh, one other big challenge is that some of these minefields are literally up to three miles deep. More and more information is coming out about these minefields that the Russians have planted. So three miles deep. That is almost impossible to try to describe how long three miles in is when you're talking about mines. Some of that minefield um, clearing equipment will fire rockets with it a long line of explosives behind it. And those are like 500 to 800 meters long, which is, if you can think back to when you used to have to run track and field in high school, that's like two laps around the track. Well, 
that's nowhere near three miles and that's not fun to be driving one of those vehicles and being targeted while you're trying to clear large areas of mines. So that's kind of some of the bigger issues. Now, one other little nugget in that story before I want to get into some of the frustrations of the U.S. officials is in that article, the Washington Post quoted a officer in the 47th Brigade that if you recall, we talked about several weeks ago that pile of Amer- of uh, Ukrainian equipment that was partially American and German and it just looked like this unit really took some you know ugly fighting and it did come out that what happened in that situation according to this officer that was quoted off the record is that this unit had been following a path that sappers had prepared with paths that had no mines unfortunately this unit got a little turned around and took the wrong route. They go into a minefield. It hadn't been cleared of mines, so they start hitting mines. And while that is happening, the Russians start hitting it with anti, anti-tank anti missiles, also uh, for, with helicopters from overhead, and also with artillery. So this unit just gets absolutely just, you know, that's just a bad night. I don't care if you're an American unit. I don't care who you are. That's not a fun night. And so that apparently happened... And that is why there was that pile of equipment. So it was kind of nice to find out a little bit more details about that, assuming that's true. But that, based on the way the equipment was piled up, that seems pretty reasonable. And it also seems to follow. If you remember at the time, we shared some video that showed, from the Russian perspective, the Russian helicopters attacking these uh, vehicles that were stranded and piled up. And so they were able to hit them with helicopters. And again... If you're not a military uh, expert, the range of anti-tank missiles, these helicopters can fire further away than the tanks can. So it's pretty easy for helicopters to sit a mile or two away, fire these anti-tank missiles, whereas the tanks have shorter range on their main guns and their machine guns. So they were basically sitting ducks. And of course, this is happening at night. It's dark and the Russians have thermal optics. So these tanks in the dark look like big orange shiny easy to hit targets so it was a bad night for the ukrainians that night for sure so for all these reasons the ukrainians have as i said resorted to using small sapper teams taking their times moving taking their time moving through these minefields and clearing them i've got an article and i've actually got the gift link in the episode notes as just kind of a gift to you guys i am a subscriber to the washington post i think it's a great publication to subscribe to it's not even that expensive but you can read this article for free in my if you just go to the episode notes it is literally the best article i've read about what is happening there in the past few weeks that you're going to find it's a little bit long but just really a great article so uh it's called the biggest obstacle to ukraine's counteroffensive is minefields got the link to it in the episode notes but let's get to that little bit of part that i was teasing to which is that There's a little bit more going on because you're starting to see some frustration from American officials. And I wanted to quote a part that was a U.S. official who spoke on the condition of anonymity. And he said that U.S. and other European nations had trained Ukrainian troops on integrated offensive maneuvers and that the U.S. had provided mine-clearing equipment, including rollers and rocket-fired charges, which is what I was discussing earlier, And the official said that applying all those capabilities in a way that enables them to breach those obstacles but do it quickly is paramount, or obviously very important. Um, And while he acknowledged that they understand it would be very difficult to do with Russian drones and anti-tank munitions, the U.S. officials are increasingly believing that Ukraine needs to hit hard and actually apply a lot of power to a specific section of the line in order to do a big breakthrough. That's the gist of what you're increasingly starting to hear. In fact, in one of the articles that I read, one U.S. official was saying that the Ukrainian forces need to use, quote, combined arms operations that involve coordinated maneuvers by large groups of tanks, armored vehicles, infantry, engineers, artillery, and sometimes in limited cases, cases, even air power. And so apply all this to one point in the line, bust through it. I will say this was what I initially thought would happen. 
I've been optimistic, my long-term listeners know, and so Ukraine doesn't appear to be doing that. Ukraine continues to say, hey, they lack air power. Russia controls the skies, and so they are using a very systematic, slow approach to minimize casualties. They say they can't use meat grinder tactics is what their defense minister said in an interview, that the most precious thing is the lives and health of their soldiers. But it does appear that U.S. officials are starting to get a little frustrated. The U.S. has provided a lot of aid. We're, we're well over 40, uh, $45 billion, I believe is the last number I saw, in aid to Ukraine. So starts you're starting to hear some frustration among U.S. officials. And part of what's adding to that is that to date, of 12 trained brigades that Ukraine has, they've only fielded four of them. So I think the U.S. is just thinking like, man, like, what are you waiting on and when are you going to do it? You're, you're literally using like a third of the power of your best troops, of the best vehicles and equipment that you have. What are you waiting on? You know, this fighting season will only last, you know, a short time. And then again, it'll get it'll get too wet and then it'll get too cold and we'll again be back to a stalemate. So starting to see some um, pressure, I think, from U.S. force or U.S. leaders behind the scenes and it's starting to leak out. We'll see if that leads to Ukraine doing a harder push somewhere. I think it possibly could. I don't I still don't know what their big strategy is. I still think when Russia blew up that dam in the beginning, it really messed up Ukraine's plans. But it's impossible to know for sure where these brigades are or where or when they're going to hit. But we'll see if they do in the next week or two. Now let me get to that big third thing that I mentioned earlier. And then we'll move out of this and talk about some military units of our own and some things happening that I think you need to know about. Now here is the third big thing I wanted to discuss regarding Ukraine. I've shared some stuff thoughts and stuff that I've seen out there, but I really wanted to quote something that is just absolutely huge, and it was said by someone who is really in the know. This was said by Dr. Richard Haas. He's a longtime diplomat, huge voice on American foreign policy. He's actually the president emeritus of the Council on Foreign Relations. He's been just involved in everything you can imagine when it comes to international relations And so he was on Morning Joe this morning, or I will say this morning, I'm recording it on Wednesday, so you'll hear this on Thursday. So I guess I should say yesterday, but he he was on Morning Joe, and this is a bleak picture that he paints, unfortunately. And so I definitely wanted to share this in the interest of making sure you guys were aware. I've been a bit optimistic, but it has been pretty tough so far for the Ukrainian Ukrainian counteroffensive. So let's listen to what he said and the almost shocking thing he said regarding the fighting. And and he makes this prediction going all the way out to 2025. So this is going to be a good minute plus that you're going to listen, but it's worth listening to. He makes some pretty bold points, and I just definitely wanted to share this with you guys. So again, this is Dr. Richard Haas being interviewed on Wednesday, July 19th. Richard, let's uh, continue our tour of the globe and talk about the ongoing conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine. A lot of good feelings coming out of the NATO summit last week, certainly. A note of unity struck by President Biden, the alliance growing. Um, But the facts on the ground remain what they are. Uh, And the president even acknowledged that President Zelensky told him that the counteroffensive has been a real, real slog. There also seems like there's no momentum, none, for any sort of negotiated settlement anytime soon. And we now have uh, Russia bailing out of the grain deal, which could have real consequences uh, far beyond Ukraine's borders. Everything you said is, is spot on. Look, this, this counteroffensive is encountering all sorts of difficulty. You've got dug in Russian forces who have used mines in enormous quantity and it slowed things down. Plus, it's churned up 
uh, churned a lot of uh, Ukrainian equipment, caused a lot of casualties. So right now, the counteroffensive probably cannot be s sustained at this level of, uh, of, of intensity, and the cluster munitions and the aircraft are not going to transform that. So that's one thing. Two, yeah, the Russians are pushing back, but they've got limited leverage. One thing is the grain deal. So we'll see uh, how disruptive uh, that can be. But the bigger story, yeah, this is going to go on. I see zero reason to believe that either side is, is ripe or ready for negotiations. I think the Ukrainians haven't yet come to the conclusion that they can't militarily liberate their land. Russia clearly is playing for time. They would love to see whether the West fades or obviously looking at the American presidential race. So I don't think, Jonathan, you're going to see serious negotiations if I were a betting man until early 2025. Uh, I think the Russians want to see the lay of the land. The Ukrainians want to see how well they can do. So my guess is no matter how much diplomatic effort there is, I don't see a big payoff probably for another 18 months, which means this, the second fighting season, has to end, and probably a third fighting season. And this just means an enormous amount of destruction is still ahead of everybody. Mm. So that is certainly a bleak picture that is being painted. Let's just hope that it's not completely accurate and that the Ukrainians can find a way to break through and do some real damage to the Russian military mindset as well as their military itself and that they might pull off some of the breakthroughs that we're all really pulling and hoping for in the West. Just a quick reminder, if you love what you're listening to and would like to help support the show, you can do so by signing up as a monthly paying subscriber. For $5 per month, you can help us sustain, grow, and improve the show. As you can probably tell, I truly do believe in trying to highlight what our military troops are doing around the world, unite our country, and remind us of how lucky we are to live in America and share plenty of motivation and wisdom at the end of each episode, because I want to help encourage you and lift you up. Long term, being able to quit my day job would be a dream come true. It's honestly what I feel compelled to do. And frankly, being able to do this full time would provide more time to cover news, unite the country, and focus harder on motivating others. These are all things I feel drawn to do. In that same line of thinking, I feel compelled to write fast-moving action stories about military service and police work. And while on the one hand you could simply say these are action thrillers meant simply for enjoyment, I think these books serve a deeper purpose as well, as I think they help attract talented people to both the military and law enforcement. Obviously, these are two crucial needs for our country. But you don't have to sign up as a paying subscriber. I already have an awesome group of folks who are throwing a few dollars into the pot each month to keep the show going, and I thank God for each of these people. If it's meant for me to return to being a full-time author who also does the weekly podcast, then my dreams will come true. But on the other hand, if it is meant for me to continue working a day job and doing this on the side, then I will know that it is God's will, and I will be grateful for two things. For the financial stability my day job provides me, and I will also be grateful for the opportunity to reach hundreds of people each week as I try to help influence our amazing country's direction. If you would like to sign up to support the show, you can do that through my Substack page. You can find that at stanrmitchell.substack.com. Again, that is stanrmitchell.substack.com, or you can find it in the episode notes. Thanks so much, guys. I appreciate each and every one of you and how much you're doing to support just a little guy from East Tennessee. As you guys know, every week I like to highlight some military unit that's doing something. And this week there are three things I want to discuss regarding our U.S. military and things they are currently doing. The first thing I wanted to mention this week is that President Biden issued an executive order approving the mobilization of an additional 3,000 reserve members to be deployed to Europe as a part of Operation Atlantic Resolve. So what is Operation Atlantic Resolve? Operation Atlantic Resolve began in 2014 during the first invasion of Ukraine by Russia the United States and the United Kingdom wanted to take some steps to help 
provide some additional deterrence to Vladimir Putin and Russia. And so some additional forces from the U.S. and the United Kingdom, as well as some other NATO nations, were positioned closer toward Russia as a part of the defensive posture of NATO. So they moved some troops to the eastern flank, such as places such as Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. And so we've been keeping troops there since 2014. And recently, of course, we have increased the mobilization of some reserve units as part of our arming of Ukraine and also continuing to provide some deterrence to, like I said, Vladimir Putin and Russia. Obviously, a week or two ago with the situation with Wagner, the paramilitary group that is under the command of Prigozhin, that, as you recall, made the quick march toward Moscow before turning around and returning to Belarus. There are things that are just a little less than ideal along the flank of NATO. So President Biden again authorized 3,000 members of the reserves to go there to further augment the defensive posture. And so this is just a reminder that, you know, we all know family members or friends who are in the reserves. They typically just serve a couple of weeks in summer and a weekend a month as a part of their drill rotation. But this is just a reminder that they do more than that and that they play an important role and they are often called to active duty for situations such as this. So keep all those men and women who are getting that called up, getting that call up, and also their families and your thoughts and prayers because probably a lot of them got that notification in the past day or two, and they're going to be heading toward Europe for an indeterminate amount of time, certainly weeks or months but no time has been listed. But that's a lot of people. That's a lot of lives that have been uprooted and altered over, you know, with just the signing of a pen. So anytime you, you raise your right hand to serve our country, you know your own call. And so just want to uh, give a shout out to those reserve members who are being called up and, and doing the tough work that very, very few people are willing to do for our country. The second thing I wanted to mention this week is I wanted to give a big shout out to all of those men and women who have been working to destroy and get rid of the numerous chemical warfare munitions and projectiles that the U.S. had. The U.S. achieved a major milestone this week and they have now destroyed all chemical weapons that we had that were in stockpiles. This is part of an international treaty and it does include actually Russia and China and I'll give Russia some praise which isn't something I do very often but they actually destroyed all of their weapons before we did this was all done with additional outside monitors to watch the destruction the US got a little behind on getting everything done but they have completed it just an idea of how much has been destroyed we're talking 30,000 tons of chemical warfare agents including 780,000 mustard agent field projectiles. A lot of those are artillery rounds. I mean, how would you like to be handling that stuff and being a part of the dangerous work of destroying it? They had to get rid of sarin nerve agent munitions. So this is something that was done under a international treaty. It was called the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, or OPCW, Literally, almost every country in the world was a part of this treaty organization. 99% of the countries were, including Russia, including China. So Russia's destroyed all theirs. Again, this was all independently verified. China is still working to get rid of theirs. Um, believe it or not, I did some research on this. Some of their remaining chemical weapons are chemical weapons that were left from World War II by Japan. So these are hard to find. They're in remote areas and difficult to get to to destroy, but China is working to destroy theirs. Now this is a topic that I could talk about for some time because I did a fair amount of research on it before pu pulling this short segment together, but we don't have time to go into all that. I've been trying to keep the podcast shorter, but what I will offer you is I'm going to leave in the episode notes 
a link to the information about China and their efforts to try to destroy theirs, as well as a link to this international organization so that you can read about it. Because if you're like me, when I first started reading about it, I was a little skeptical that Russia or China would actually be destroying theirs. But there's some great links in it, and it describes why the world kind of came together to get rid of these weapons. This is something that uh, I think all countries don't like trying to maintain these weapons. They're very dangerous. There's obviously the danger of them getting loose. So pretty interesting stuff. This is the kind of things you don't hear about in the news. You only hear about this stuff when it's bad, but it was a huge achievement by the United States. So uh, huge congrats to all those who finished up that work. Uh, we really appreciate all you guys have done. I know that has not been fun or easy or safe work for sure. The final thing I wanted to mention regarding our military for this week's podcast is I wanted to give a little bit of spotlight to the National Guard unit in Vermont that responded to just the horrendous flooding that happened. As you probably know from the news, the um, state of Vermont got an entire two months of rainfall in two days and led to some deaths and just unbelievable flooding. The Vermont uh, National Guard responded. There were also some National Guard units and rescue teams from North Carolina, Massachusetts, and other states that went in to help rescue folks who were affected by the flood. They helped rescue pets. They delivered water. They alerted folks where water was contaminated, the regular water drinking supply. So, a lot of people did a lot of work to scramble and help make what was a horrible situation a little less horrible. So that's the kind of thing that the National Guard does on a regular basis. And these recent floods were just a great example of how even internally our military does things to help our country that we just so often take for granted. But thanks to all those who responded to that just horrific situation up there, we really appreciate it. We are now going to get into the best part of the show, the motivation and wisdom section. We're going to begin the motivation and wisdom section with a little pep talk because someone out there needs to hear this. I know someone out there needs to hear this. Listen, life is passing you by. You only get one shot at life and you're letting it slip through your fingers day by day. Life has beaten you down, kicked you in the face, ignored you punished you, rained on you, assailed you with illnesses and injuries, burdened you with debts and levels of despair that I know are breaking your spirit. But you have to get up. Do you hear me? You have to get up. You're going to get up, and you're going to get up now, and you're going to start fighting back. Do not let despair win. Get up and take a step forward to confront these things facing you right now. Do it now. And let the following items that I'm going to share lift your spirit and take you to a higher level. You can do this. You're meant to do this. And you have to do this. For yourself, for your family, for your creator. And with all of that being said, I truly hope these help pick up your spirits, that they help revive your hopes, and that they help make you a better person. I hope that pep talk helped motivate you and wake you up. I once read, if you don't think you're powerful... Think of your most important relationship of that person who's depending on you. Maybe it's a son or daughter. Maybe it's a parent you're caring for. Maybe it's your spouse. If you don't think you're important, if you think you don't matter, imagine if you suddenly went away. Who would care for that person? Who would check on them, love them, care for them, help them? We are all way more powerful and important than we think. And the work we do, even that work we forget about and sometimes complain about, it's important. You can have an impact. You are having an impact. And now that you're paying attention, let's share a few more items to help feed you and make you stronger. Here is the first one. Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. Again, the quote is, Optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. It's a good one. Next one. 
Be so positive that negative people do not want to be near you. That's a good one, isn't it? Again, be so positive that negative people do not want to be near you. Next one. This is a quote from Aristotle. The quote is, The purpose of knowledge is action, not knowledge. Again, the purpose of knowledge is action, not knowledge. Which, obviously, the point is, it doesn't matter how much you know. It's what are you doing? What are you actually accomplishing or using that knowledge for? Again, the purpose of knowledge is action, not knowledge. Let's go to the next one. Nothing will work unless you do. Again, nothing will work unless you do do. Let's be pushing, right? Let's all be pushing. Next one. All big things started small. I love that one. All big things started small. It's so bad how we compare ourselves to others who are so much further down the road and we just don't we don't think about that at one point they were probably where we are. All right, here's the next one. Failure doesn't mean the game is over. It means try again with experience. That is such a good one. Again, failure doesn't mean the game is over. It means try again with experience. Even failure can be a good thing, right? Next one. Your goals don't care about your excuses. Another tough love one. Again, your goals don't care about your excuses. No excuses, just get it done, right? Next one. A year ago, I wasn't who I am today. A year from now, I aspire to be even better. Personal growth takes time, but all things, excuse me, all great things do, so I've learned to stay patient. Let me read that one again. It's a little bit of a longer one, but it's a good one. A year ago, I wasn't who I am today. A year from now, I aspire to be even better. Personal growth takes time, but all great things do. So I've learned to stay patient. It's a good one. Next one. It does not matter how slowly you go, so long as you do not stop. It's a quote from Confucius. Again, it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. That quote definitely applied to the book I just finished this week because it took about three times longer than I expected. But again, it does not matter how slowly you go so long as you do not stop. Let's do a couple of faith-based ones. Here's the first one. God has perfect timing. Never early, never late. It takes a little patience and a whole lot of faith, but it's worth the wait. Again, that one is God has perfect timing. Never early, never late. It takes a little patience and a whole lot of faith, but it's worth the wait. Next one. This was uh, shared as your something you could pray for today. So your prayer for today. Dear Lord, I want to be worthy of your trust and faith in me. Please help me believe in myself and my abilities as you do. Amen. So again, dear Lord, I want to be worthy of your trust and your faith in me. Please help me believe in myself and my abilities as you do. Amen. I'm not sure why it is, but none of us believe in ourselves as much as we should, do we? And, you know, a lot of times it's uh, it's one of those, if you if you have a desire that's inside of you, there's a... Uh, I feel like you're supposed to go after it, and we never feel like we're capable of it or that we have the qualities or whatnot. That's the doubt. That's the devil. That's the lack of confidence that we have, but we got to be more confident. we got to be willing to go after those things. That's what I believe. I always like to end with this one. Be the reason someone smiles. Be the reason someone feels loved and believes in the goodness of people. I always think that's a great one to end with. And with that, thanks for joining us this week on The View from the Front. For those who want to know a little bit more about me, here's the short version. I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and I left home to join the Marine Corps at the age of 17. 
I was also crazy enough to demand that the Marine Corps put me down for guaranteed infantry. I served four years in the infantry, saw enough danger to decide I no longer had anything else to prove, and I exited military service in 1999. I earned a degree from the University of Tennessee in journalism and spent 10 plus years in the news business. I worked initially as a reporter, but then went on to start a weekly newspaper. What can I say? Anyone crazy enough to start a weekly newspaper at the age of 27 is probably a dreamer and an optimist, and I confess that I'm both. I owned that weekly newspaper for nine years, but once it was clear that owning a newspaper wasn't the best path to financial security, I went on to become an author. To date, I've written 11 books, and while I still have my sights set on the tallest peaks in the writing world, I'm now here as well, a once-a-week podcaster who's still in love with both this country and the news. And I see this podcast as a small way to continue serving our country, doing my best to inform and unite us in a time that we're as divided as we've probably been in a hundred years. Well, I've talked enough about me. I really hope you'll consider at least signing up to be a free subscriber. And if you can, consider at some point becoming a paid subscriber. Again, you can do both of these things at my substack, stanrmitchell.substack.com. Again, that's stanrmitchell.substack.com. As a reminder, please be kind and try your best to love your fellow Americans. Let's all work together to unite this country. And also, please try to be a better person each and every day. Try to be kinder on social media and how you interact with others with whom you disagree. And if you've got a dream kicking around in the back of your mind, go after it. If you have that friend or family member that you know you should reach out to, who you haven't talked to in a few months, reach out to them. Finally, make sure you check out my books if you haven't yet. I've written 12 of them. I have somehow been fortunate and lucky enough to have sold 70,000 copies, and these are all independently published, so that's really quite a feat, honestly. I absolutely have to give credit to God and to my awesome supporters for sharing word of mouth in order to pull off selling that many books, although I do believe that God gave me a gift with an ability to tell a story, keep it short, and keep the pace moving. Obviously, you can't really be an author without first being a reader, and I absolutely hate slow-moving plots. You can ask any of my friends, and so I think one of the things that sets me apart a bit is just how fast the writing is. Some reviewers have called it cinematic, but I know in today's society, it's easy for people to get distracted, so I don't put a ton of description in. I try to keep it moving fast, and I can have really short chapters. So that is the unpolished, honest sales pitch on my books. You can find all 12 of them on Amazon by searching for my full name, Stan R. Mitchell. Again, Stan R. Mitchell. There are several Stan Mitchells, so if you don't include the R, it can be a little hard to find. Although, I've got links everywhere for my books, so if you want to check them out, definitely do so. And with that, we will wrap it up. I really hope you guys join me next week. If you have some feedback on the show, drop a comment. I try to keep an eye on comments. I'm not some kind of big shot, so I usually at least like them and or reply. You can also reach out to me by email if you have any tips, complaints, compliments, questions. You can reach me at authorstanrmitchell at yahoo.com. Once again, that's authorstanrmitchell at yahoo.com. And believe it or not, guys, I'm one of those weirdos that actually answers my emails. Almost always when someone emails me, they are stunned to get a reply, usually relatively quickly within a day. So I've had everything from, I don't understand why this is happening. Can you explain this bit of news? Or you didn't put a link to this. What's your source for that? Or, hey, what do you think is going to happen over here? Or even, could you explain this next week? I try to answer every email, so again, don't be scared. Reach out. And with all of that out of the way, I am out. See you guys next week.